Okay, well, as, as people come in, I will welcome you to our December town hall um, here at Copperleaf. My name is Michael Thompson, and uh, our topic today is really uh, a market review and, and preview. And uh, I'm going to welcome our guest um, in just a minute. As we get started, uh, let everybody know that um, we welcome your questions. If you have questions along the way, please enter them in the chat or raise your hand, and we'll be addressing your, your questions. Um, we also record these sessions, so this will be recorded and posted on our Copperleaf YouTube channel um, sometime next week. So thanks, thanks everybody, for, for, uh, for joining us today. And I'll welcome our guest. Welcome, Larry Swedro. Larry is um, the head of financial and economic research at Buckingham. Um, one of our the, our partner our partner firm or the association that we're members of, Larry is um, a good friend and an expert in uh, all things uh, economic and uh, and financial. Um, Larry is the author of of many books. I I have lost count, Larry, but some of my favorites I'll just share. Um, your complete guide to successful and secure retirement, one of our favorite books, and also most recently. Larry's your essential guide to sustainable investing. Um, if anybody has uh, would like a copy of these, please let us know, and we'd be able to happy to provide you with uh, with a copy. Larry's a frequent contributor to the Journal of Accountancy, um, the Journal of Investing, Personal Financial Planning, Journal of Indexing, and a number of other um, uh, academic and and professional journals in our area, and a frequent contributor to. Um, television shows uh, on CNBC, CNN, Bloomberg, personal finance, and so forth. So we are thrilled to have Larry um, joining us today. This has become a, an annual event, and we're so happy to have Larry here. So Larry, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be back, Michael. Yeah, thank you. So um, Larry, I wanted to start off with uh, kind of a, a, a review a quick review and sort of summary of this year. What a year it's been in the financial markets and the economy. Um, maybe can you can you walk us through a couple of highlights about what we've experienced this year and uh, what investors have have seen? I mean, we've we've been through a year of um, up and down markets and and bond the bond market's been a little bit unusual and the economy is. Is a whole another animal. So, give us a, just a little review of of what you've experienced and and what you've observed this year so far. Yeah. So, I think uh, to begin, uh, this year was certainly a good example of that old curse: "May you live in interesting times." Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, this certainly has been an interesting year, not only because of the geopolitical risks from the Ukraine, the Middle East. Uh, China, uh, and a number of other issues uh, as well. Uh, this was the first year uh, uh, ever, when I just went back and reviewed it, that we have actually seen double-digit losses for both the broad market indices like the S&P 500 representing equities. It also happened to be double-digit losses for equities around the globe. So developed markets were down double digits, emerging markets are down double digits. So diversification of equity risk didn't help much this year, at least thinking about it globally. But it was also a year in which safe bonds, treasuries of lo longer term safe treasuries also went down double digits. So the traditional 60-40 portfolio had its worst year since 1937. And it's the only year when both of them were down double digits. Now, this has been a big shock for a lot of people who relied solely on the idea that safe, you know, longer term bonds would act as a, the anchor in the storm, keeping your ship safely in the harbor uh, when equities were getting hit. And they were accustomed to that uh, really because of what I would call recency bias. Okay, and I'll explain in a minute. Or what I would say is, or of ignorance of the data. 
I don't mean people are ignorant, they're just not aware of the data. So it's yeah. not ignorance in a pejorative sense. I um, think fairly intelligent, but I'm ignorant about lots of things like nuclear physics. And my <laughs> wife and three daughters tell me women is another subject I'm <laughs> ignorant about. Uh, yeah. But at any rate, so what happened really are uh, most investors, let's say their investment horizon, uh, you know, might be 20 or so years, right? From mm -hmm. the time they start investing, paid off their college debts, they're now saving. Let's and think about in their knowledge base and their memory, that recency bias looks at the last 20 years and they're unaware of the longer term data going back that we have say a hundred years. So what, what's been the big two trends over the last 20 plus years? Equity valuations have gone up right yeah. after the bear market crash when the, the dot-com bubble burst and then we had 911. But since 2002, when equity valuations were again were lower, they went way up. That was interrupted in 08, 09 but then went back up. But most importantly here, bonds have been a secular decline in yields throughout the entire period, basically. And really even going back 40 years uh, to when Volcker you know, went and won the battle of inflation and long-term bonds went from the mid double digits down at the bottom you know, to around 1% even for longer term bonds. So, what that meant is over the last 20 years when or so, whenever we had a bear market in stocks, bonds rallied and, right, because we didn't have yeah. an inflation problem. It was a deflationary recession in each case. 911 caused the recession, prices went down. Uh, and then 2008, we had a recession where prices fell. And we had an era of globalization where we were importing deflation, if you will, from China and India, Vietnam and other places. That's all being reversed now. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So what investors got accustomed to was even if equities got hit, their safe bonds would help. Right. And their typical 60-40 portfolio would not suffer that badly. So a lot of investors really were shaken up. By that one thing we have avoided is investing in longer term bonds for just that reason that we know that that's not the only environment. We tried to seek a balance between reinvestment risk. We don't want to get too short because if rates collapse, then you're in trouble. But right. we don't want to get too long because we know there are periods when both stocks and bonds will do poorly. It's not that. The, I mean, let me say that the evidence says that stocks and bonds are not negatively correlated. I mean, yes. when one does well, the other tends to do relatively poorly. They're uncorrelated. Right. And what that means is when one is doing well, the other may also do well. Right. When one is doing poorly, they both may do poorly. And when one is doing well, the other may do not well. Right. The evidence says this, when we get inflation moving up, not from low levels, like zero or 1% because we're in a recession and we're fighting a problem like in 08, then inflation moving up while being bad for bonds is good for stocks because economic activity is picking up, allowing companies to raise prices, wages are picking up a little bit. So we can see periods when bonds do poorly, but stocks are doing well. Yes. However, if inflation is rising from a higher level above where the Fed would like to see it long term, then the market has to worry about the Fed tightening, putting the economy into recession. Rates could go a lot higher. That raises the discount rate and hits equities that way. Uh, so the, this was a year where that risk showed up, but it wasn't the only time. There were yeah. eight other episodes of that, which is why one of the cornerstones of our investment approach has been to think of a seesaw, or what some people call the teeter-totter. We didn't want too much inflation risk by going too long because this could happen. And we didn't want too much 
reinvestment risk so we don't go very short. And we tend to stay in the three to four year or so, five year, four to five year period. We'll shift a little bit when rates and the yield curve is very flat and you're not rewarded well, we will tend not to you know, go long. We'll actually shorten up maybe from five years down to three or four. Uh, and if the curve is very steep, we may go a bit longer because the evidence says you're, that's exactly when you're rewarded more. So we might extend another year or so, but we want to keep that balance. So that was probably one of the biggest things that happened. Second was, thing yeah, oh, go ahead. I'll, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll cover briefly is this was now the second year uh, where we saw our value start to outperform again after its deepest drawdown in history and longest for three years uh, from 17 or late 16 through late 2020, value had its deepest drawdown ever. Uh, even worse than the drawdown in the dot-com era when we had a growth bubble. But we believe in the long-term evidence and the logic that value stocks will outperform in the long term. We know that there are long periods where all assets that are risky go through such periods. The S&P itself, people may forget, has gone through three periods of at least 13 years where it underperformed totally riskless treasury bills. Yes. Uh, and there are periods when the S&P dramatically underperformed international emerging market stocks. That's why we diversify globally. Yep. So we stayed the cost, rebalanced, bought more value in 17, 18, 19, and 20. And value has been on a massive outperformance since really October, uh, November of 2020. So now two full years and another month. And yet still important for your listeners, it is trading at about the 90th percentile of cheapness in history. So that tells us the value premium is likely to be bigger than it's been historically. That's the odds favor that we, there are no guarantees here. But just to help your clients get some perspective, if you want to look at valuations, currently you can go, say, to Morningstar, look at their portfolio tab for a mutual fund, and you'll find that the Vanguard S&P 500 index fund, it's got a current P of about 17. Mm -hmm. If you were then to look at, say, Bridgeway's small value fund, its current P is seven or eight. Wow. And if you look at the same numbers internationally, either using Dimensional or Avantis's uh, ETFs, for example, their PEs are seven or so, while the broad market indices are much higher. And the best estimate we have of future returns is the inverse of those PE ratios. So that's telling us the market, while saying these are riskier assets, they have much higher expected returns. Last comment I'll make. Uh, one of the most important lessons I think investors need to learn, but tend to forget, because it comes around only maybe once a decade or every 20 years, is when you have very loose monetary policy. Yes. That what happens is investors start to buy into stories and you get bubbles in stocks, but eventually economic reality shows up and those bubbles inevitably burst. So investing in things like story, young growth companies without earnings, but plowing huge dollars into investments, like we saw in the dot-com era, yes. they blew up those stocks, right? Now you would think that lesson would have taught people to not make that mistake again. But the exact same thing happened. A good example was Kathy Woods and her AUK ETF, which had spectacular returns for a few years. Then once the Fed abandoned its zero rate policy, rates went back to normal, little economic cycle risk shows up, and that's been the single worst performing fund. And most of these young growth companies with big investments, story stocks, have gotten hammered down 60, 70%. And the crypto bubble 
uh, at least in my view, view of bubble, has shown up as a problem, and that has seen there. So that's a lesson uh, of history teaches us. You want to make sure you learn from history uh, and use long-term evidence and don't fall subject to fads. Yeah, you're you're touching on a couple of things that I think are really important to our clients and and our audience, which is first and foremost, um, you've you've talked about the evidence and how we practice what we call evidence driven or evidence based investing, which means as you as you so well point out and represent, we look to the research, we look to the academic world and the published research to inform the 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 advice that we give the portfolios that we build and um and the the direction that we go with clients with clients portfolios and and I think that's so important. I want to back up a little bit Larry and ask you if you'll um help help define for our audience one of the things you talked about. I think it's important you talked about PE ratios and I'm not sure our audience may altogether really understand what that means. So when you talk about a, a PE ratio and um, translate that for us a little bit, what does that mean to an investor um, and how should they be thinking about that? Yeah, so a PE ratio is taking the price of the stock, dividing it by its earnings uh, and that's your PE ratio. Uh, mm -hmm. Think about if you owned uh, an apartment and building and you're leasing it out, and let's say you paid $100, you're collecting $10 in rent. In the real estate world, that's called the cap rate, and mm -hmm. that's your expected return. In the stocks, you would take that and say the PE is 10, and the cap rate would be the earnings yield, of mm -hmm. 10 over 100, and that's your expected real return as well with stocks, mm -hmm. okay? Because stocks have expected growth in the long term, real assets, they grow with inflation. So you would take the PE ratio inverted, you get an earnings yield. So today, uh, well, let's look at this number to give a little bit of perspective. Yes. At the start of the year, uh, before the bear market hit us, the long-term P.E. ratio, something uh, Professor Schiller, who was won a Nobel Prize, created something called the CAPE-10, or the C-A-P-E, Cyclically Adjusted Price Earnings Ratio. He looks at 10 years. There's nothing magical about 10. It'll work whether you use five or eight or seven, as it turns out. But he says earnings are cyclical. And if you're at the bottom of a recession, your earnings are way down, the market is still looking forward and doesn't expect earnings to be that low over mm -hmm. the long term. So we want to take the average of, say, the last 10 years, adjust them for inflation to give us a more normalized level. And if you're at the top of an economic boom, you would want to do the same thing because earnings are not likely to stay the level they are, say, in 2022, mm -hmm. if we get a recession, then earnings will go down. So again, you want to smooth the earnings. Mm -hmm. That P-E ratio was, let's meant to do the math easy, say so it was roughly 30 at the start of the year. Yeah. If we invert that to get an earnings yield instead of a P-E ratio, that would tell us that our best estimate over the very long term for stock returns that in real terms would be one divided by 30, which would be 3.3%. If you mm -hmm. wanna estimate inflation for argument's sake at 2%, then you would expect your nominal return over the long term to be about 5.3%. And that's the number that we would put into a Monte Carlo simulation. Mm -hmm. Now it's important that investors understand, you have to think of that 3.3% as the median in a bell curve. We don't know what the return will be, but it's our best estimate. We know there's a 50% chance it'll be higher than that and a 50% chance it'll be lower maybe. And that's why we run a Monte Carlo simulation running 3000 possible scenarios. Yep. Today, the S&P current PE is about 17. Mm -hmm. 
So that's going to tell us about a 6% expected return in real terms, which is pretty close to the historical average. So much better outlook than it was. And that's because prices are now much lower. So the bear market has helped restore returns to some degree. For value stocks, I mentioned the PE might be eight or seven. Now the P, uh, earnings yield is 12 and a half in, and that's just the nominal, uh, that's the real return. If you expect inflation again, you would add on to that. Yeah. Internationally, the PE ratios are, in, uh, are lower than 17. I think the developed markets are more like maybe 13 and emerging markets more like 10. So you yeah. would invert those. So that's how we think about things. And when you show your clients a Monte Carlo simulation, they're going to take the current bond yield because that's our best estimate of the future return. And then we're going to take the earnings yield, those inverses of the PEs to estimate the future real return. And then for our estimate of inflation, we look at the TIPS yield or the treasury inflation protected securities, subtract that yield from the nominal bond. Today, the 10-year treasury, I think, is about 3.6%. And a 10 year tips, maybe 1.2. So that's telling us expected inflation 2.4. Yep. Yep. Which is, which is interesting. And one of the reasons I love these discussions about what does the evidence show when the headlines, the news um, is, is, is telling people that inflation is running at seven or eight percent. Um, and yet, the 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 market and other indicators are telling us that the that the long term projection for inflation is 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 quite a bit lower than that. So um, let's talk a little bit about inflation and and its its impact on clients' plans and also where did it come from and and where's it going? You got a crystal ball on on inflation? Ah, I have a crystal ball. Unfortunately, it's pretty cloudy, like the weather in St. Louis <laughs> yeah. in the winter. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's start. Inflation is almost always purely, as Milton Friedman, our most famous economist perhaps, said, uh, a result of excess money chasing too few goods. So a big problem has been that the Federal Reserve engaged in a very stimulative fiscal, uh, monetary policy, drove interest rates to way down. And there was nothing wrong with that because we needed to help revive the economy, uh, one, after the or during the great financial crisis, and then two, when COVID hit. Unfortunately, yep. at least in my opinion, and in many others, including people like Larry Summers, who was a chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under Obama, uh, had felt that the Fed made a very big mistake. One, it had made earlier uh, under Greenspan, and it was, and the mistake was this: they kept pumping up out the money supply, and in fact, not only cutting interest rates, but ballooning its balance sheet from two trillion to nine trillion. And yes. what that means is they're going out into the market and buying bonds that, in order to suppress yields, even on longer term bonds. And that puts money in people's hands because they bought the bonds, investors now have the cash to invest. And, and what that ignored was while there was no goods inflation going on, right? Partly because mm -hmm. people didn't have money to spend things on maybe in right, COVID, right. right? But we were in a recession, but at, because yields were so low, asset prices went way up. Yes. And partly because we have a massive shortage of housing uh, for a number of reasons we could discuss if you're interested. Uh, housing prices went through the roof because affordability became much cheaper when mortgage rates dropped under 3%. Yeah. So what happened is in the 90s, Greenspan admitted later he made a mistake uh, and kept rates too low because he didn't see inflation in goods but it was in commodities, stock prices, real estate. And then, of course, you got 207. You, you had a ball. If the Fed had tightened sooner, we never would have had that real estate bubble uh, and that great crisis that happened. 
personally, I thought that was a big mistake. I personally sold all my longer term bonds uh, about two years or so ago. Uh, and we shortened our duration, you know, as well as as a firm because of the yield curve was so flat, you weren't rewarded. So the Fed was continued to pump money in, made a mistake, and they're catching up. Now, having to raise rates much faster than historically because they waited too long. That problem was compounded by incredibly bad fiscal policy, uh, pushing much more money that was needed into the economy than was needed. All right. And but this has been a problem. We've had bad fiscal policies. I don't want to just, you know, uh, highlight the Biden administration running a deficit of 15 percent of GDP when the economy only dropped several percent. Mm -hmm. Right. You, if mm -hmm. the economy drops, say, five percent, you add five percent fiscal stimulus to offset that the economy didn't drop 15 percent, which would have been you know, the Great Depression, we were nowhere near that, but that's how much money they put in. You're going to get inflation, yeah. you know, from that. But the last four administrations have unfortunately ballooned the budget deficit. Uh, Clinton left the budget deficit in very good shape. We were even worried about running out of treasury bonds because the debt was going to disappear. Yeah. And now we're sitting looking, beginning to have the country approaching, looking like Italy, where the debt to GDP ratio is above 100%. That's a high watermark that historically has increased the risk that you'll have negative impact on economic growth. And that's what's happened in Japan and Italy and other countries as well. That's a concern longer term about the economic outlook and investors should be right. So, we had a compounding of bad monetary policy, staying too loose too long. I mean, why are you buying mortgage bonds when housing prices are going up 18% a year? Why are you trying to stimulate demand? Why are you having zero and very low interest rates when the unemployment rate is 3.7%? Mm -hmm. right. it, it made no sense, but they ignored the fact that there were signals in commodity prices and housing prices and stock prices and bubbles and these, you know, speculative stock stories and cryptocurrency, the money goes somewhere. Right, it's, it's got to go somewhere, right? Spent. And so it shows up somewhere. Hopefully, the Fed, now having seen that mistake twice, will never repeat it again. But so now the Fed is behind the curve, having to drive rates way up. So let me see if I can summarize where I think yes. now the economic situation is. We have kind of a contest between two forces here. We have the economy is doing much better than most people th thought. We are not in a recession, right? Even though the Fed has raised interest rates 400 basis points and is set to raise them at least another 50 probably uh, at the next meeting. Uh, the unemployment rate is almost at its low at 3.7. We're adding almost still this year almost 300,000 jobs a month. Consumer spending is holding up. Now, one thing I'll mention is part of the reason consumer spending has been very strong despite inflation is one job market is strong, but also the Biden administration, the, all that fiscal stimulus that went out there, sat in people's pockets that had excess savings. The saving rate historically has been in the low single digits, went into the low double digits because people couldn't spend, couldn't travel. And, and so that, but that money over the last two years is being drawn down. The estimate is by the end of this year, maybe 40% of it will be left. That could hold spending up, I think, through next year, but that'll run out eventually. So that's an issue on that side. And, and what, uh, is that, so what does that mean when, relative, when that runs out? Oh, go ahead. Uh, so we, we have a relatively strong economy and the very tight labor market yes. is very good for, for workers whose wages are going to be going up. Strong. They have a lot more power in negotiations. You just saw a great example. Delta 
got like a 30% raise over four years, I think, for their pilots. The railroad workers got a nice raise. And that is something the Fed doesn't want to see. How are you going to get 2% inflation when workers are getting such high wages? And what people fail to understand maybe is, is this. The good news is the goods inflation has been dropping sharply. That yes. the Fed can control, all right, to some degree. It, this, it, but if you have a tight labor market, that's a supply of labor issue, not a demand issue, right? They're going to spend money on things, and that's going to affect the services inflation. Mm -hmm. And serve it, go eat in a restaurant, get a haircut, right? The prices, hotels, airfares, they're all moving up pretty strongly. Mm -hmm. And so services are 70% of consumption. Wow. So that's, the, we're going to see this battle. And the other side is you have the housing market really getting hit. That's 15% or so of the GNP. We've had eight months in a row of home sales you know, falling. Housing prices are coming down to some degree. Rents are start, have peaked and have fallen slightly the last three months. So you get a negative impact there. But I have some bad news for people there. The housing collapse means there's no new housing going to be being built. And we right. have a 4 million housing shortage, just part of the reason housing prices have gone up so much in the last few years. Right. And so I think longer term, that's a negative. So I think you'll continue to see longer term pressure on rents, which is 40 percent of the CPI medical costs. We have big shortages of doctors, nurses, other people. That's going to keep wages high, which will be hard to suppress them. So my own view is this. I think the market, the risks are, I should say, the market thinks inflation is going to come down over the longer term to about two and a half percent. Maybe some point next year it hits down to three and the right. year after two and a half. I think the Fed, because of these issues and one other point, is going to have to stay tighter for longer than people expect. The other point is this. Everyone, I think, understands that globalization helped hold inflation down over the last 20 years as we imported through companies like Walmart and Costco, deflation, buying cheap goods from China and India and other places. Now, that also had a negative effect of hollowing out our manufacturing sector, yes. right? Lost jobs. Today, everyone's woken up to the fact that that creates risks. We got a nice benefit, at least in terms of inflation. But there are big risks, including national security. So what's happening? Deglobalization, onshoring, at a time when you're short labor. Right, right. You know, so I don't see how, while you know, people understand that globalization helped hold inflation down, deglobalization and even protectionism. I mean, we just had administration pass this anti-inflation act which was anything but an anti-inflation. It clearly is going to raise inflation, okay? And one of the reasons is if you onshore and give subsidies to do that, what happens, right? It's gonna be more expensive to build cars and other things here in the US than to import. Now, that's good for workers though. Wages will be strong, but not good for inflation. Mm -hmm. So I, that's the third reason I think tight labor markets, tight housing, deglobalization. I think the Fed is determined to win this battle to restore their credibility. So I think they stay tighter and, and for longer. So I don't think we're done. I think at least the risks are that the Fed is not done at this next 50 basis points move. The peak may not be 5% as the market is now expecting. Maybe it has to go to five and a half, maybe even a bit higher. I don't think there's much risk it gets worse than that, yeah. uh, unless we get some black swan. But that means I think it's going to be continue to be a tough year for stocks, at least the growth type stocks that dominate the market indices. And it's not going to be a great year for bonds either if yields have to 
keep moving up, especially on the longer end of the curve, if I'm right, and yields stay a bit higher. So that's, I think it'll be a less challenging year by a lot than 2022, mm -hmm. but 2023 could be a year of relatively low returns, maybe even slightly negative for stocks and bonds. But I think alternatives that we recommend are actually positioned to have very good years because of one, rising rates helps their returns. In most cases, value is cheap and reinsurance premiums have skyrocketed. So the reinsurance fund we recommend, or at least one of them uh, from Stone Ridge, CRX, SRIX. Five years ago, the no loss expected return, Michael, was 15%. The expected wow. losses with a bell curve were eight. So we expected a 7% return. Yep. Now, T-bills were only 2%. So, right? So a 5% risk premium. Yeah. Today, because of losses from the last several years, and by the way, the fund right now is up about five and a half percent, even after the big loss from Ian. Yeah. But today, the expected or the no loss return is 32 percent for next year. Wow. Part of it because now Fed funds are higher. So you, you sit on the cash until they are claimed. So if you have a normal year, we could see returns in the 25% kind of range. And if you have twice as bad a year in terms of losses, returns could still be in double digits. Now that doesn't mean you can't have losses. Right. So right. people have to understand you get a premium for taking risk. Yeah. But the same thing is happening similarly with funds like Cliffwater and Lendex's lending funds because the T-bill rate has gone way up and credit spreads have widened because of concerns about the economic risk. So the expected or the current yield, for example, for Cliffwater Fund is now about 9.5% and has no inflation risk because it resets pretty much every month. Lendex is a, even a bit higher, but it, and it has very little inflation risk, but some because its average maturity is 1% year not yeah. three four or five so let's let's i want to pause on that on that note and remind people that um if you have questions please enter them in the in the chat uh or the q a and and we can we can address any questions that you have um so as you started talking about alternatives larry um uh, you know i was going to ask the question about what is all this you know you started to paint a pretty gloomy economic picture moving forward um, and, well, let's, and let's balance that. Uh, gloomy doesn't mean I think we're going to get a deep recession. I think, in fact, there's even maybe only a 50% chance we get a recession at all, meaning yeah. two negative quarters of you know, a GNP growth. But I think that risk certainly exists. Uh, the leading economic indicators, one of them is the yield curve when it's negative. Yeah, uh, it tends to predict a recession. Uh, a Fed study that uh, uh, looked at the odds of recessions based on the steepness of that curve today, that with the curve very steep at about 75 basis points between T bills three months and the 10 year, would put the odds of recession a little bit above 50%. So it's not even a certainty that mm -hmm. we will have a recession. But I don't think the economy is going to be booming, certainly. I don't think it's a great environment for either stocks or bonds for the reasons I mentioned. Yeah. And and so the so the question is for our investors, for people in um, from a planning perspective, for people in retirement, for example, what should they do? Is there anything that they should do to think about? preparing for this this uh you know what what you're talking about what you're presenting is the outlook in the short term for uh, stocks and bonds we'll certainly come back to alternatives in a minute um but also for um for folks who are not retired our our clients that are still in their working years and maybe even have their peak working years ahead of them um are there are there any steps that 
that you see that makes sense moving forward? And I, I can think of a few things, and let me just name a couple of things that we've certainly seen, which is uh, cash is now, you know, earning some money. People are, are getting a little bit of uh, yield on their cash, which is a, a positive for those th folks that need to have some cash around. For our retired clients, the risk of losing their job if we go into a recession is not so much a concern, but there may be other concerns. For our clients who are still working and working towards getting to a point of retirement, they've got to maybe be a little bit more defensive in terms of their reserves and, and being concerned about you know, what happens if they happen to, to lose a job if we go into, go into recession and things like that. But I wonder if there are other things that that you think about, you know, what's the impact of of this sort of near term environment on clients plans and let, maybe let's start with our kind of retirees. Um, I think I know the answer because we always tell people our Monte Carlo simulations really take a lot of these things into account and look at the impact of various environments. Um, for, for stocks and bonds and, and inflation moving forward. Um, but, you know, as we pointed out, this has been a this has been a hard year for the 6040 portfolio. So maybe we come back to talking about how to think about alternatives and what is an alternative and what does that mean for for clients' portfolios. And I'm thinking that may be maybe where you're going. But <laughs> gee, Mike, you put so many things on the table, we could take an hour to try to address <laughs> them. Let's see if we can compress. Let's pick this. a couple. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the place to begin is you highlighted, in fact, something that I think is absolutely critical and a mistake many people make is they create an investment plan and then it's set in stone. That's wrong. You right. create an investment plan based upon the assumptions you make in them, which includes what your expected return to stocks and bonds. So when the expected returns change, that changes your need to take risk, right? Yeah, if yeah. bond yields are now higher, you now can own more bonds because, right, you can get that yield and you don't need to take as much equity risk. Right. If equity prices are now much lower, then your expected returns are higher. You don't need to take as much equity risk. Yep. Your aunt dies and left you a million dollars. Well, you now you know, don't need to take as much risk. You're right. older. you now nearing retirement. You may not be able to take as much risk. Yep. Right. So an investment plan should be a living document. That's yes. why you meet with clients something like once a quarter. And the first question I always tell people you should ask is, has anything changed in your life that's affected your ability, willingness, or need to take risk? So I know that, and we can build that into the plan. Yes. I'll add one other, a couple other quick thoughts. Bear markets are exactly what young people should root for, mm -hmm. as long as they don't get unemployed. Right. right. That's the problem. So right. it depends on your job because you're going to be investing more over time. You have that on your side and you want to be buying at low prices, not yeah. high price. The huge bull market we had in you know, 10 years after the great financial crisis was the worst thing that happened to young investors because they were doomed to get very low returns from both stocks and bonds. Yeah. And it showed up this year. Now, yeah. markets going down restored some of that. So, right? Yeah. But, right? So that's, that's a positive. So let's start with that. Yeah. Second thing I want to point out is this. W one of the things you have to recognize is each person has their own unique ability, willingness, and need to take risk. And retirees in, you know, have some advantages of, over those who aren't, then they have some disadvantages, right? Uh, and so you build those into your plan. Let me gi give an example here of a of a, a investor who has a big advantage. That's Yale and Harvard of the world. Yes. What's their investment horizon, Michael? 
Well, it's it's probably a hundred years or more, right? Or more. Yeah. So they can take advantage of assets that have what's called an illiquidity premium. That people say uh, a young investor who's trying to save for a home in you know three or five years, they got to have more liquidity, or they're just saving to build an emergency fund. They can't invest in a rubber plantation in Indonesia, just right. to pick an example, right? Uh, but Harvard's and Yale's have known that they could take advantage of that because they only spend about 5% or so of their assets every year. So they invest in assets that have illiquidity premiums. Once you have an illiquid asset, the expected return goes way up because people want and need liquidity. So let me give a simple example. If you're a bank, and you have a credit card portfolio, and let's say the yield is 16%, and you expect losses of 10 of eight. So now your expected return is eight, and it costs you 1% to service that uh, loan. So your net return is seven. If you securitize that, put it into what's called an asset backed security, sell it to the public who buys that cash flows. The yield's going to drop immediately to like 5% because right. the investor could buy it and trade it. Yep. Now, if I'm Yale or Harvard, I have exactly the same risk if I own the credit card debt directly or if I buy the asset back security, which do I want to buy? Yeah, I want to own it directly. I want to own it directly. It's the same risk. And I don't, now, I can't do that for 100% of my portfolio. Yeah. And I don't even want to do it for 90%. Because I need to keep assets, even though if I spend 5%, I may want to do rebalancing and stuff, right? When I get some unexpected event, I need cash flow. Yes. So one of the questions I'll ask Michael, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer is zero, but how many of your retired clients are taking more than their RMD, their required minimum distribution? Yeah, pretty much zero. Zero. So yeah. that's telling me because at age 90, you don't even need 10%. You don't have to take that. And all illiquid assets that we recommend anyway are in what are called interval funds, which have a minimum distribution of up to 20% a year. This is a free lunch for you and you should be eating as much of it as you can. As long as the assets meet your investment criteria. And obviously they do what we wouldn't recommend. Now the Harvards and the Yales of the world are among the smartest investors in the world. Take a guess, Michael, what percent of their portfolio is alternative? So the typical retail investor is 60, zero, 40. Right. 60 stocks, zero alts, 40 bonds. What's the middle number for the Harvards and Yales? I'm going to say 20%, but I'm probably wrong. It's probably more like 40. It, you're, now you're even too low. It's oh, in wow. the 50 to 60% range. Yep. And that's because they recognize that this illiquidity premium is there. And they know they have the patience to, to wait out long periods of bad performance. They know, they know three years is meaningless. Five years, even 10 years doesn't tell you much. The average investor doesn't understand that. And I mentioned earlier, from 29 to 43, 15 years, S&P underperforms T-bills. 66 to 82, 17 years, S&P underperforms T-bills. 2012, underperforms T-bills. Better yet, 69 to 08, 40 years. S&P underperforms the 20-year long-term treasury bond, a riskless asset for a pension plan with nominal obligation, not the S&P, sorry, growth stocks. Yes. The darling of investors for the last four years or decade, right? Underperformed for 40 years. Yep. So yep. does that mean you avoid equities because they go through long period? And that could, I'm a retiree. I don't have that long. I can't wait 13 years. Well, that's why we diversify, not right. run away. And right. so that's why we want to add other assets who have unique risks, knowing that some of them may do poorly, like reinsurance did from 17 through 20. 
did great the 10 years before that, not one year of losses, would have helped greatly in 08. All of the alternatives we recommend this, this year went up. Some of them went up a lot. So that's why we add them into portfolios. And I personally look more like the Yells and Harvards. I have 40% of my assets. So yeah. I try to encourage people to add more risk assets. And let me show you a slide. Uh, yes, please. I mean, if I could, I'm going to share my screen here. And I need to, there we go. All right. So let me just quickly walk through this. This is the core of our investment philosophy. Yes, we, thank we you. We think that markets are not perfectly efficient, meaning they don't always get the prices right. There are bubbles, as we mentioned, in you know, like dot-com stocks and recently lots of other uh, types of hyper-growth stocks, you know, story companies. But the evidence is clear, while it's possible to win the game of market timing and stock picking or active management, the odds of doing so are so poor you shouldn't try. So we use all passive or systematic strategies, no individual stock selection, no timing. Yep. If you believe markets are efficient, the only logical conclusion you should draw is that all unique sources of risk have to have similar risk adjusted returns. So let me give an example. Let's say you think US stocks have a higher expected return than emerging markets. Well, if that's true, what's gonna happen? Money would flow out of emerging market stocks into US stocks. Right. That'd drive US stock prices up. You don't change the earnings. So the expected returns go down. Emerging market stocks prices go down. You didn't change the earnings. Expect the returns go up until we get an equilibrium. Yeah. So that so that doesn't mean they have the same expected return. That means they have the same expected risk adjusted return. Yeah. So I mentioned earlier, emerging market stocks today are trading maybe at PEs of eight, while the S and P is seventeen. So if you invert those numbers, you get six and twelve. Well, why don't we own all emerging market stocks? Well, one, they can do poorly. And two, they're trading cheap for a reason. There's risk, right. Right. but they have the same risk adjusted expected return. So what we recommend is market cap weighting, right? The market yep. says you should have, call it 12 or 15% of your money in emerging markets so of your equities. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. Now, if you believe that all risk assets have similar risk adjusted returns, meaning reinsurance should have the same risk adjusted returns as stocks and lending to middle market companies, adjusting for the risk, including accounting for, I say, two or three percent illiquidity premium. If I'm not getting at least that, I should have known it, right? Because yeah. that's yep. a risk, right? then you should diversify across as many unique assets as possible. So, but the typical 60-40 portfolio is dominated by market cap risk. Let me show this very quickly and then yeah. we'll show one other slide. So this is the right way to think about risk. If we ask clients, you've got a million dollar portfolio and 600,000 in stocks, 400,000 in bonds, how much of your risk is in stocks? They typically say 60%. Right. But that's not true because the stocks they own are much riskier than the bonds they own. So the way you think about these things, the way I'll explain it is they uh, sophisticated investors think about it in terms of a risk budget and how much, many points of risk do I have? So if we think about stocks, volatility, which is one measure risk, not the only one. Remember, we have to account for illiquidity. So we would assign yep. that risk. So 60% stocks, 20% volatility, 60 times 20, 1200 risk points. Mm -hmm. Bonds, our Buckingham typical portfolio, four or five years average, volatility maybe of even five. So 40 times five, 200. 86% of our total 1,400 risk points is in stocks. Right. 
which doesn't make sense if all risk assets have similar risk adjusted returns. Right. So let right. me show one last slide here. Uh, I gotta, let's go up. I wanna show your clients are probably familiar with this type of slide because mm -hmm. you've shown them Monte Carlo simulations, I imagine. Yes. So I wanna focus on this number here the fourth line down, it's, so let's do the third line down. That's that typical 60, 40 market portfolio. And yep. we're gonna instead, this is just one example, you can run others. Let's take 15% of the equity allocation and move it to the alternatives that you, Michael, use in your portfolio. Yes. Now for some clients, they may wanna take some from stocks and some from bonds, mm -hmm. right? Depends on the client. If we did this, our Monte Carlo assumptions show that if you were taking a 4% withdrawal rate, you would improve the odds 9%. Now that's in absolute terms. In relative terms, of course, it's much better, right? Because if your Monte Carlo is 80 and now it's 89, it's much more than 9%. That's a yeah. huge increase. And retirees, this is exactly what they want. They're not, yes. they're giving up the bigger upside of stocks. The alts are never going to go up a portfolio of them 25 or 30% a year. But collectively, they've never lost 25 or 30. It's possible, but it's never happened. Well, stocks can go down 60%. Right, right. So you trade off that. And here's what happens in a portfolio. If you think of a 60-40 portfolio, Michael, look at the expected return. Let's say today we thought it was, you know, maybe 8% for a 60-40 portfolio. Yeah. So that's this middle line. That doesn't mean you're going to get eight. We have no clue. We right. run a Monte Carlo and it shows us this black line, this wide dispersion of outcomes right. where half or more than eight and half less. You could end up in this fat left tail if you're in that bottom 5%. And you could get this great right tail if you're in the top 5%. Right. But portfolio B is the one that like adds alternatives. It has the same 8% expected return. And the trade-off is you can't get those great right return, tail returns, but you avoid that left tail risk. And this is the risk here on the left side that causes portfolios to fail. So yeah. it's unfortunately for many people, it's the retirees more than anybody who should be, in my opinion, loading up on alternatives because they're going to reduce that left tail risk and they don't need liquidity. They're not yeah. buying a home in the next five years or though. They can take look for more risk. So my own suggestion is at least consider, there's no right answer, the best portfolio is the one you will stick with. And if you can't stick with a portfolio that earn, has say 25 or 30% alternatives, then don't do it because right. it will, right. the risk will show up and you'll panic. If you yep. can, then as I said, my own portfolio has much higher allocations and the Harvards and Yales of the world do well. Well, and the, and the answer goes back to planning and making sure that every client has the right allocation for their needs and, and that we're taking into account their their yeah. income and their expenses and their need for cash and liquidity. And, and we build a, a, a proper and appropriate portfolio for the long term um, and, and help them manage. Yeah, Michael, that. I know we're running out of time, but we I are, do yeah. want to give one good example that should good. be short to help people understand. Yeah. So one of the more popular investments I see people making in the last few years because of you know, uh, the low rate environment and even today, is they need more yield than T-bills is say Vanguard's high yield bond fund. Yes. It's got tens of billions of assets. Now I haven't looked recently, but the last time I looked the yield may have been five and a half percent. It's average maturity though, is last I looked, I think was like six or seven years. So oh, you yeah. do have a lot of duration risk, mm -hmm. meaning inflation risk, and you have significant credit risk. Yep. 
I think a far superior alternative, but you give up that daily liquidity, is Cliff Waters fund CCLFX. Its current yield is about 4% higher. Mm -hmm. It has one month of duration risks. So you're getting a much higher yield. You're getting much less inflation risk, which is, I think, something retirees in particular should be worried about, right? Mm -hmm. And it is much better historical credit risk. The index on which it is based is that average credit losses of 25 basis points over its 20 year history. Wow. A small fraction of the credit losses of a high yield bond fund. And you're getting all of those benefits for giving up liquidity. To me, that's as close to a free lunch as you're going to get if you don't need liquidity. Yeah. And so I can't think of a single reason why anyone really, if they understand these things, wouldn't, so that's why I have a very significant allocation to that. I also have a significant allocation to Lendex, which is a little bit more risky, uh, but a bit higher expected return. So I diversify across corporate loans and, uh, and consumer loans. But if you're real conservative, just stick with the corporate loans and you ha would have a pretty good downside protection. Not perfect, but good. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Larry. We are we are um, at our time now, so um, it looks like we've got one question. I may try to squeeze in sure. a question. I'm here. happy to stay, Michael. Yep. Um, how do you feel about cryptocurrency as an alternative? I think I know the answer to that, but I'll throw that out to you, Larry. Right. I'll try to keep it simple. One, uh, several years ago, a colleague of mine, Tim Jost, and I wrote a paper on that. So, Michael might share that. I don't think any of my thoughts have changed. Personally, number one, uh, I would start with this. And I've talked to many experts on the subject. I've read many books and papers. And I have a view. It may be right or wrong. I know my crystal ball is cloudy. Yeah. What I can tell you is this. The blockchain technology is very important and is going to be incorporated uh, in many different things. That tells you nothing about what the value of Bitcoin is, so don't confuse it. Personally, I think Bitcoin, number one, is not an investment, nor is any crypto. It is a pure speculation. Assets are worth whatever people will pay for them. Right. Well, one time, seashells served as currency, and right. we know they're worth nothing today as well. Right. I think cryptocurrencies, the flaw in them is this. There is literally an unlimited supply of alternative cryptos. And whenever you have an unlimited supply of anything, the price should go asymptotically to zero. I have no doubt we're going to see many cryptos from central banks. I, China has already got one, other countries are planning. I think the US will have a cyber currency because it will allow faster payments to be made. It's crazy that in our system today, we have trading, your Michael, your clients can't get their money out for two days after they trade. Blockchain right. could allow that to be instantaneous. Right. So that's going to happen. But my own view is there's a greater likelihood that, that Bitcoin will be closer to zero than it is it will be closer to 100,000 or a million. Both are possible, but I wouldn't invest a penny of my money in a pure speculation without any logic, in my opinion. I can't think of any economic logic why Bitcoin should have any value. Yeah. My opinion, others differ. I agree. Larry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to thank you for your time. Thanks so much for spending time with us at the end of the year. I want to wish you a, a, a happy holidays and a happy new year. I know we'll get a chance to speak again in the coming year. Thank you for your time today, helping uh, helping us look back at 2022 and forward to 2023 a little bit. And uh, I want to thank our attendees for joining us um, uh, today. Next month in January, we're going to be talking about what is evidence-driven investing and um, I'll look forward to catching up with everybody then. Larry, in the meantime, thanks a lot. See you later.